Now, I'll turn things over to Alexandra Harris for an introduction to the program and our presenter. Thank you. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Alexandra Harris, a senior editor and writer at the National Museum of the American Indian and co-author of Why We Serve, Native Americans in the United States Armed Forces. I'm very pleased to host this special presentation on Native American Code Talkers by author, anthropologist, and historian, William C. Meadows of Missouri State University. Dr. Meadows is the author of six books, five of which focus on Native American veterans. His most recent book, The First Code Talkers, Native American Communicators in World War I, was published in January, 2021. He will speak about Native American code talkers and their unique contrib contributions to the US Armed Forces for about 40 minutes. After that, I'll serve as moderator in a question and answer period in which we invite you to ask questions. And now I give you Bill Meadows. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, uh, especially, I want to thank the National Museum of American Indian for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I've been involved with research on Code Talkers since about 1989. So I'm going to be doing a little bit of an overview uh, regarding both world wars. So welcome to Native American Code Talkers, A Lasting Legacy. Um, I always dedicate my presentations. I've, I've done all of them this way over the years. This was uh, uh, Forrest Casnavoy to Comanche, who was a Comanche code talker in World War II. Uh, he was the gentleman I was working with on another related subject uh, that led me into uh, finding out that there were other code talkers than the Navajo. And so he's really the gentleman that got me started on the code talking road, I might say, and that road is still uh, taking me forward. So I, I have a great deal of respect and gratitude to Forrest. Uh, how and why did code talking develop? So uh, we're going to go back to World War I here, which is a four-year uh, campaign, basically. The United States gets involved in it fairly late, mostly in the, in the uh, years of uh, the spring of 1917 and then into the fall of 1918. Uh, code talking is really not going to uh, develop or I would really say be discovered uh, and used until very late in 1918. Uh, the first indications we have is probably somewhere around June and July of 1918, and then other cases in September and October. So we're in the Meuse-Argonne campaign. This is the final big push. Um, Germany is already on the retreat. Um, America has added a lot of troops in to support uh, the other allies. And so uh, the war is not determined yet. So the Meuse Arcone campaign is a big push uh, by the Allies to finish off the war in the summer and fall of 1918. The situation that the Allies are experiencing, including the Americans, um, is that the Germans are, uh, you know, amazingly educated people, have excellent linguists and coders and decoders, things of this nature in a communication section. So the American communications are constantly being compromised. And there's kind of four different scenarios at this time that you can send messages in the front in World War I. The first being phones between two companies. So two companies, uh, infantry companies primarily. Well, uh, this involves a wire and anyone who can get to any point uh, between point A and B on that wire can simply tap into it, clip onto it, and it's just like a party line on a telephone. You can listen in uninhibited. Um, they have distance listening devices. So these are uh, kind of, they're like a, a coil, a metal coil that works on a magnetic pull. And they can be set up anywhere up into uh, three to five kilometers behind uh, they're your own line. So you don't even have to get close to the front line. Using the magnetic pull, they can pull a phone or radio frequency in and listen to it that way. There are buzzer phones, uh, which buzzer phones have to be, uh, they work on a series of lights and, and length and sound of buzzes. Uh, they're very slow to code and send a message and very slow to decode. So while they work, they're very, very slow and they're eating up a lot of time. Uh, the fourth method is simply to hand a handwritten message off to a runner. But the minute a runner pops out of a trench and is hurrying down to another unit, everyone on both sides understands what he is uh, attempting to do. And so snipers and other machine gun fire and things pick up trying to pick that 
individual off carrying communications. So one out of four of these individuals are either being shot or captured. And in either event, the message is not getting through. So a dire need for secure communications, but also communications that are faster than anything that we're able to do with encryption. Uh, so faster than any way of coding and decoding that we have at this time. But it's gotta be something that can be immediate. It's gotta be something that is secure. And what this leads to Native American code talking is really, it's a very impromptu experimental tactic. Uh, there was no existing plan in the United States uh, military arsenal, uh, no previous existence of this. It was something that was tried in the field uh, to solve a pressing issue uh, at that point in time. So really an experiment. Uh, this is a picture of a um, World, War, uh, World War I telephone set. So this is in an area where the Germans have been retreating and they began leaving lines intact instead of destroying them or taking them with them, leaving them intact. Uh, they were being pushed back very quickly, but also Americans suspected they were leaving these lines intact, hoping that they would just simply use them rather than their own lines, and it would facilitate uh, the Germans listening in much easier to American communications. So Americans suspected this very quickly, and this was another factor in searching for some other more efficient way to send messages. Um, the individuals that are going into World War I, as far as Native Americans are concerned, of course, uh, many of them are in uh, boarding schools at this time. And so this is a picture of uh, um, Armstrong Indian Academy at Bochito, Oklahoma. Uh, this is a group where a recruiter came one day. These uh, young men enlisted. Uh, most of them are juniors or seniors in high school and then joined the military service. Uh, many Indian boarding schools were targeted or kind of um, selectively recruited because they knew there would be a large, large number of males there that were uh, of age to join the military service. Uh, this is a E company in the 142nd Infantry um, in Texas, and this is the actual company. At one time, it was completely uh, Native American, uh, about, uh, I think, 15 or 16 different tribes in it, uh, all Native American except for a couple officers. Uh, later on, some of the men were transferred to another division, but it still remained uh, around 60 to 70 percent Native American through the whole war. This is the actual company in which the Choctaw Code Talkers will originate from, part of these men in this picture here. Um, we have really three instances where we have the specifics about code talking being used in World War I. Uh, one of the best documented is, is this here. So we have a couple maps here. The map to the upper left here, uh, this is the overall picture of the uh, Meuse Argonne campaign. So you see a number of arrows pointing towards the, the city of Sedan. Uh, Sedan was very crucial because it was a major railroad hub. It had several highways. It also had several rail lines coming into a, a large station there. Uh, it was the artery of the German supply for their uh, armed forces. So both troops passing through this area, but also uh, ammunition machines and, and so forth and so on. Uh, the goal from the Allies is that if uh, they can push forward through places like Chateau Thierry, St. Mihiel, Verdun, and capture Sedan, they will sever that supply line. They will literally uh, have half of the German army off to one side that cannot get resupplied, <clears throat> and the others to the left um, separated from the ones on the right. So this is the major objective. On the way to there, uh, we come to the Battle of Forest Farm. Um, so this is a peninsula you can see on the Ain River here, and uh, this is the actual schematic from the uh, from the uh, campaign and everything. So the Germans had retreated across the Ain River, except for this very prominent peninsula, and it was a, a very high peninsula, so it could cover anyone approaching them for several kilometers. Uh, it had good uh, lateral, they could cover the sides of the river, uh, good peripheral and lateral coverage. This had to be taken before the Americans could get across the Ain River in this sector of the war. Uh, the French tried three times to take this position and the Germans repelled them at great cost. Uh, finally, they were relieved, the 36th Division of Americans were brought in. And from this, uh, they looked at the situation and 
uh, knew the situation with the phones, the Germans were compromising their communications, and so decided to try a tactic. So in the 36th, these are five of the original eight Choctaws uh, with Captain uh, E.W. Horner there uh, beside them, uh, who was the company commander, first a lieutenant, then commander. Uh, eight of these individuals uh, were pulled out. And at first what they did was two of them uh, were used to do an experimental message one evening. And the message was to move two companies of men. This would have been roughly around 400 troops uh, from point A to point B and then to see if the Germans reacted to it. So they sent the message in Choctaw. <clears throat> the move was made of the men. The Germans made no response to the movement. So that told the uh, Americans that they undoubtedly could monitor the message and hear it, but they were not able to speak Choctaw and therefore could not break the message. The very next day, they recruited eight of these men, secreted them in different companies and different uh, positions on this line, uh, they sent all the messages and the preparation material for an attack on this position in Choctaw uh, with the exact time that it would kick off. Uh, it was started with a 20-minute uh, artillery barrage, and then the troops followed the barrage, what they call a walking barrage. They were right behind the artillery, just a few meters. And so the artillery forces the Germans down into their dugouts and their um, uh, foxholes and trenches, and so this allowed the Americans to literally be right upon them when the artillery ceased. Uh, they took the, the entire position, losing only 14 Americans. Um, over 500 Germans were captured or killed uh, in the event. So this um, secured the idea very strongly in this sector that yes, these Native American uh, languages would work. We have another example of the Eastern Band Cherokee uh, that were used in a, another sector of the line. We also have a very good uh, example of two Ho-Chunk uh, from Wisconsin who were used in yet another division. So this is the basic premise behind how they're going to be used and, and, and why it's going to work here. Now the Choctaws were relieved after this uh, three-day engagement, uh, sent back to a rest camp, and immediately the eight Choctaw had 10 more men added to them. So now it was 18 enlisted men and three non-commissioned officers. They were trained for a week uh, in, in using radios better, in practicing sending messages in their own language. And then of course they realized there are some things we do not have equivalents for in the Choctaw language, certain military um, topics. So this is where the, at least the first documented case we have of, of actually creating code terms to then be inserted into the native languages. So this is a list of the Choctaw terms that were created over those five days of training. Now they finished this on November 10th, the training. Uh, of course, the very next day, the armistice was signed. So the uh, 36th Division, the Choctaws did not get to go back into combat and actually use this. So they used their language initially, but more importantly, they established a precedent and an idea now for forming specialized vocabulary that can then be inserted into the language. Um, there may have been other groups in World War I that did this. We simply have no documentation. Uh, so it's very, it's very possible, but we simply cannot say at this point. Uh, this uh, two other individuals, Calvin Achevit, who is a Comanche, was in the 90th Division. He was awarded a uh, Belgian War Cross specifically for using his Comanche language uh, to help uh, troops in a situation in which they were basically surrounded and needed support uh, and relief without saying it in English because then the Germans would have, would have understood the message. This is George Adair, who is an Oklahoma Cherokee. He was also in the same engagement with the Choctaws, uh, the 36th Division there using Cherokee language. So there's at least two languages we know being used at Forest Farm in that uh, campaign. The formation, again, no overarching plan. This was uh, the best we can tell at this time. These are what we would call independent invention in, in anthropology. That is, different individuals uh, came up with the same idea, but without contact or influence of one another. Uh, they're all facing the same situations, and many of the divisions that had large numbers of native speakers uh, came up with the idea or dawned on them, we have a language the enemy will not likely know. Let's use them for our, some of our most vital communications. 
Uh, so why code talking work? Well, there's really kind of five, five factors here. Um, they're little known languages, and I say little known to the Germans, okay? Um, they're known, of course, very well in their home communities and surrounding communities and everything, but little known to Europeans and to Germans. So therefore, they're very obscure languages. And most of these native populations are, you know, relatively small compared to, say, France or Germany uh, as a nation. So less speakers, less well known. They're largely unwritten languages. Uh, so there are writing for Choctaw and Cherokee well back into the 1820s in this period, but most of it is for uh, Bibles, it is for hymnals, for church services, uh, or some tribal newspapers. However, it's not the kind of materials that are widely published beyond the community and that Europeans would have access to or in their libraries. So they're largely unwritten to them. These are regular languages. They're not based on mathematical codes where you're switching, um, say today F will equal an A and G will equal a W. Um, so they're not based on mathematical principles and frequencies that can be studied and broke at this time. They're not based on European languages. Therefore, the language is different, the syntax is different, some of the grammatical rules, etc. So it makes it that much harder to find similarities with any other language that the German knows to compare. And then, of course, as coded vocabulary is created, and this will be really expanded upon in World War II, um, that makes them a code within a code, an unknown, obscure foreign language, but then with specially coded vocabulary, only the code talkers will know. Um, I determined two types of code talking in my initial study with this. Very simply, they both are using Native American languages. It's simply one type is using specially devised coded vocabulary inserted into it. The other type is not. The second type or type two is just everyday vernacular language as that community spoke it at that time. However, both forms work in both world wars. Both forms work perfectly well. Um, and more importantly, they are referred to. A lot of people say, well, this is not really a code, it's just an unknown language. Well, if you really look at the definitions of a code and everything, um, it doesn't specify that it has to be a substitution system. It's anything that is not known to the others that represents what you're trying to get across. So both the military officers and units and the press, uh, even in World War I, refer to these as new types of codes. And so they've generally been accepted as a, a newer style or newer form of code. Uh, these are the three earliest documented or four earliest documented groups that, that we have information on. Um, so from the left here, we have the uh, Ho-Chunk Nation in Wisconsin. Um, you see their flags here, the uh, Eastern Band Cherokee, North Carolina, the Choctaw of Oklahoma, and then the um, East, uh, Western uh, Oklahoma Cherokee from Oklahoma here. And so these are the earliest dates. We, it was long believed that the Choctaws uh, were the first code talkers. And for many decades, this is, this is all we had. Everyone had the same information. Uh, however, more recently, I've found two other groups that date, have definitive records that date slightly before this. Um, the the uh, Ho-Chunks were using it uh, before June 21st in 1918. And we know this because uh, the individuals that were using it, two of them were wounded that day and were relieved and wrote letters home and told about it. So we know the exact date they left service and everything. Um, in the 30th Division, the Eastern Band Cherokee are using it uh, as early as October 7th and 8th and then through the end of the war. And then the Choctaws will be using it October 26th and 28th. Um, to me, the bigger question, of course, is not who did it first. It's to try and identify all of them eventually. And that's, that's what I'm after, to bring everybody the recognition. Uh, just a quick chart here to show Native American code talkers of World War I. So you can see uh, I have the groups named here. We know of seven groups definitively at this time. What type of code talking they were doing. The Choctaw, of course, were on the verge of, of the uh, type one here. And some of them we know the exact numbers. Now, there are other references for uh, Sioux, which are anonymous. They never say which group of Sioux, uh, the articles that mention them, or what units they were in. But we have multiple accounts, so we know that there were some uh, Lakota code talkers used. Um, and then there are actual units here. Um, another 
common uh, belief about co-talking is that it was all secretive, uh, that these were highly classified programs, they were secret, co-talkers were given instructions not to talk about it or orders, et cetera. And uh, as hard as that one is uh, to let go, it, it does not hold up uh, to evidence. And so what we find is that, again, this was a tactic that was just developed to solve a problem in the field and it worked and the war ended very you know, quickly soon after that and everybody was happy to, to be going home. Uh, this is a January 10th in the Stars and Stripes, the official AEF uh, military newspaper. So uh, talking about the use of Sioux as code talkers here. So if this was classified, the military itself would not have released this type of story. Um, even before the troops come home, and most of them are not getting home until June, uh, most of the ones that are still there at the end of the war, June of 1919, um, there are news articles in France, in French published about the Code Talkers, there are many in America. So this is an Oklahoman uh, newspaper, Oklahoma City, and talking about the Choctaw tongue gave surprise to the Germans. Uh, it tells the exact unit, tells the, the story, et cetera. So I was able to collect somewhere around 40 to 45 of these 1919 era sources and everything. So again, uh, they are from division commanders, people as high as two-star generals, uh, down to some of the code talkers themselves. And so again, it was just common. It was an interesting story and a commonly ran in the newspapers. Um, here is a uh, excerpt in the uh, Carlisle Indian School Journal, uh, one of the Ho-Chunk or Winnebago who returned. Uh, it's based off of a letter that he wrote home uh, to his father that has been preserved, but the story ran there. And then this is his uh, service card in the Indian Serviceman card files in the National Archives. And you can see where it says also adopted the Indian code signal. And this was Robert Big Thunder. Uh, forced assimilation and cultural and language suppression. So this is, this to me is really the kind of ironic uh, element of the whole Code Talker story is that this generation of individuals, and, and they're not the only ones, there were uh, students previous to them and there will be students to follow them. But most of this generation went through some type of Indian boarding school, um, whether it be a local, um, you know, community-wide or reservation-wide boarding school, or uh, one that was more far away, a removed one like Carlisle Indian School here in Pennsylvania. But boarding schools, depending on the superintendent and, and the era, uh, varied a little bit, but most of them strongly inhibited or prohibited the use of native languages or any native cultural practices or traditions. Um, there are some local schools that I found individuals that would say that they were permitted some use outside of the school, uh, but not in the classrooms, but the larger ones were very, very strict. So these are individuals who went through a era that was um, detrimental to preserving native languages, but yet resilient enough to hang on to them. And then in my opinion, gracious enough to share that when the military asked them can you send these messages in your language? And uh, no hesitation, no indications that anyone ever refused or was not willing to uh, participate. So this is really speaks, I think, to the uh, graciousness and the strength of the native cultures and the languages here. From language suppression to recruitment. So boarding schools are still continuing leading into World War II and they are still discouraging uh, native language use. However, the army, has different interests and the, the missionaries and boarding schools are trying to suppress native culture. The military sees it as many of these things are actually strategically tactically useful. And so the army begins to recruit a number of type one small code talking units from 1939 to 1941. So well before Pearl Harbor. And then in 1943, uh, another group is uh, put together with the Hopi here. So total there's five different tribes that were recruited in four different uh, divisions here. The Marines will begin to recruit the Navajo, um, but really um, it's really late April when they start their first recruitment. And in uh, almost the first of May when the first uh, uh, platoon is sent to basic training and everything. There are a series of, of um, government discussions and I covered this in my, my earlier book on the Comanche Code Talkers of World War II the Navy, Army, and Marines had a series of meetings in 1943 to 44 to discuss should we continue to use native languages for communications, should they be expanded, 
Are they uh, reliable? Are they accurate, et cetera? And despite, despite evidence that uh, they worked very well in World War I, there was no issues, no security issues, no issues of uh, loyalty or anything of that nature, there is still a great deal of reluctance um, in the military at this time. One reason being they cannot monitor the messages in themselves. They have no way of, of actually understanding the languages or monitoring. They're simply putting this uh, trust into other individuals. So the army, through a series of skepticism, um, some, some really just kind of racial um, bias, there's no other word to really describe it, or, or uh, racism. They think they're all fine soldiers. They're just not confident in, in uh, all the language transmission they can't monitor. So the Navy uh, tests some code talkers, but foregoes them. It says, we really don't need them for our, um, our activities, but that's fine. The Army retains the small groups it has, but does not expand then the Marines start uh, recruiting Navajos, the largest group in the nation, and start using them as early as September of 42. Now, I think in hindsight, which is easy for us, there's roughly 44,000 Native American men in World War II. The overwhelming majority spoke their languages, not all by this time, but the majority did. Out of that 44,000, only 640 some, uh, roughly, were used as code talkers. So in my opinion, again, uh, my research indicates it was a very underutilized uh, resource at that time. Now, despite the decision not to expand these programs, uh, lots of local commanders formed their own informal or type two, what I sometimes call incidental code talking. They simply had a situation where they found out they have two common speakers of a language or three or five or seven and they pull them and start making radio teams out of them. So there's a lot of this very small dispersed uh, type two code talking that continues throughout the war in all theaters. Again, no secrecy with this. Uh, these are newspaper articles from 1941. Uh, most of them are, uh, a couple of them are uh, August and a couple of them are very early in the year here with the Meskwaki or Sac and Fox uh, the Comanches in the middle, the Pimas here uh, in the right. Um, no secrecy about this, lots of um, uh, almost kitschish-like uh, presentation with stage photos, kind of Indian theme stereotypes. The Meskwakis pointed out, we didn't wear these kind of headdresses anyway, um, but it was, it was something they thought was very interesting and it made, it made good news, it was very slick. So it was very well advertised in the newspaper, which again, in hindsight, probably probably shouldn't have been done. Uh, these are two of the groups, the Comanche Code Talkers. This is the first group I worked with. There were, uh, I think, four, yeah, four of these individuals I got to interview that were still living and their commanding officer. And then this is uh, the group of eight Meskwaki from Iowa that were in the 34th Division here. Uh, this is a group of Hopi. There were eight Hopi who were, they were all already in service but were culled from different units with the idea of putting them together for their language. Now, they have a very interesting story. I did not get to, to meet these men personally, but I've worked with their children and their veterans officers a lot. Um, three of these individuals came from First Mesa on Hopi and the first village there on First Mesa is Tewa. Tewa is a different group that joined the Hopi uh, back in time, but not as long as the rest of the Hopi. Over time, they learned Hopi, of course, and enculturated, but they have retained the Tewa language. And so these three individuals, when they talked to each other, they spoke in Tewa for code, which was their native first language. They spoke in Hopi to the rest of the other five members. And then of course, they all spoke uh, English. So some of these gentlemen were bilingual and some of them were trilingual, but very interesting uh, case in the 81st division here. Uh, these are just some pictures of the Comanches in training at Fort Benning. So running switchboard, uh, practicing Morse code, wiring phone lines up here, some of the different Comanche individuals. This is the officer that was put in charge of them. He was a, a fresh lieutenant at the time, and I interviewed him a lot. He, was, uh, he retired as a, as a major general, and uh, he gave me a lot of particular details about the formation of the code and how they, uh, how they formed it and everything. 
Uh, these are some examples of type two code talking groups. So whereas the others were recruited and formally formed codes, developed vocabulary, very formal structure, these are simply groups of individuals that were pulled together in the field, but because they could communicate, were very useful that. So six of them at the top here were referred to as MacArthur's boys. They were from different reservations in North and South Dakota, but they all spoke dialects of, of uh, Lakota so they could communicate with each other fine. And so they sent messages, did a lot of behind the lines work, behind the Japanese lines reconnaissance, reported in Lakota, then pick up and move very quickly before they're detected. Uh, this gentleman at the bottom, Jeffrey Dullknife, was in a artillery battalion in Germany, and he and two other Lakotas ended up in that unit. And so they began to use them to uh, communicate artillery strikes. Uh, how was the code formed and used? So all these codes were formed independently. In other words, there, there was no written plan coming over from the Comanche about how to do it with the Hopi or vice versa. Each unit took care of it on their own terms and own planning, but yet they ended up being fairly similar in content and style and everything. Uh, all of them used the regular native language uh, of that respective tribe, then developed specialized code words uh, for the military things that they couldn't describe or didn't have uh, in their, in their uh, normal language. And we'll see examples of these in the next couple slides. They also formed informal or formal alphabets. So what I mean by an alphabet is you want to say something like Paris or you want to say something like Berlin. You can't say that in English because anybody in the world will understand Berlin or Paris. And so in, for example, in Comanche, they had an open alphabet. They would say in Comanche, now listen to me. And they would just start rattling off a list of words. Uh, pear, apple, rain, ice, snake. You take the first letter of the English translation of each word and you spell out Paris. You could do the same thing with Berlin, you know, uh, baseball, eating, rain, lemon, and so forth and so on. So they could use any, any word to spell it. Uh, formal sets is where a group chose a specific word or a series of words to represent each letter. So we might use these three words for A, these three words for B, et cetera. But with that, you could spell any place or proper name. Uh, code, code work for the native code talkers was usually for important objectives. In other words, uh, many code talkers told me sometimes we sent regular messages in English about all kinds of things. If it was something important, they would say, put this in code, and then they would use the native language. So these gentlemen were trained as all around radio operators uh, and can do any kind of uh, messaging or communications. The messages were kept very brief uh, to eliminate repetition. The more sample you give the enemy, the easier it is for them to analyze and find patterns. And that's what breaks codes is patterns of vowels and consonants. Uh, here's just a sample of some words to give you an idea. So in Choctaw, Tushka Chipota became the code word for soldier. Uh, in Navajo, Atsa, Eagle became transport plane. Uh, Hopi, Paaki, houses on water is what they referred to as ships. They saw where they had a room for every kind of activity, sleeping, eating, you know, et cetera, exercise on ships. So they saw it as a house that floated on water. And then Comanche, Wakare, a turtle, which became tank. So some of them are simply taking things that resemble, like a turtle resembles a tank, and then just using the Comanche word, but it became the official word for that military item. Uh, these are some more sample of Comanche words. So, uh, and there's a lot of funny stories in how some of these uh, originated, but uh, they took the word sewing machine to represent the machine gun because the similar, when you, when you uh, uh, tap the treadle of a machine, of a sewing machine to get it running, it has a similar uh, to a, a 30 caliber machine gun. So they literally called it a sewing machine gun. For the 50 caliber, they just put the word, the prefix big on to make it big sewing machine gun. So you could distinguish. Uh, Landmines, uh, it goes off by itself. In other words, you don't see it, but it explodes. Uh, mortars became stove guns because one of the Comanche's uncles back home 
had a stove pipe that was ill fitted in the house and it, it was cockeyed or leaned to the side and it reminded them of a mortar. So you see the pattern, they're taking uh, literal descriptions, they're taking things back home that they, in everyday life that they analogize to uh, and making a perfectly uh, good code. And then they even had a term for Adolf uh, Hitler, if they wanted to say his name, Positaibo, crazy white man. Uh, this is an example of an alphabet. So the Navajo had a set alphabet. So they had the word uh, moashi for cat, which gave you the C. Uh, you could take then uh, ga, rabbit, which gave you the R, et cetera. Um, I'm not good at pronouncing uh, Navajo here, but lache, lache, dog for a D. And if you took these words and then put them in the order at the bottom, spelled that out the first letter of each translated English word, then this message would say code received. So there's nothing you could not send with these alphabets. You could do anything you want to. Um, initially, the Navajo had one word for each letter. Later, they realized that would give away patterns. And so they upped it to three words, three wor separate words for A, three for B, and so on. Uh, the Navajo are the largest group of code talkers. They're also the most famous group of code talkers. And so 29 enlisted in April of 42. Uh, by the end of the war, it was up to 420 that had been trained or were still in training. Around 285 of those saw combat. Uh, everything from Guadalcanal to Okinawa and then code talkers were also used in the occupation. Uh, they were also used to report back about the impacts of the atomic bombs immediately after the war. Very critical in winning the, the Pacific campaign. And so with the Navajo, because of their, their very large size, and they're simply uh, the best documented probably group we have uh, from World War II, uh, they're, they're much more well known than others and everything. Originally, they started out with 211 code words from that first 29 men. By the end of the war, it was over 700 words plus a triple alphabet and memorized and then inserted into the language at will. Uh, these are pictures of some of the Navajos uh, in their training. It was, there was great efforts to keep their program secret. There were still leaks, but great efforts to secrete it. This is them training in a guarded uh, locked code building. Uh, and then some of them on uh, Bougainville and Saipan there. And another project I'm working on down the road is uh, cases where they, many of them were mistaken as Japanese and captured by uh, friendly forces, which is another story of interest into itself. Uh, here is another group that came up. This is in the Army Air Corps in the 5th Bomber Group. And this is a radio net that the 5th Bomb Group developed where it has roughly 15 Native Americans in eight groupings. And you can see where there's two they're paired up. So in the lower left here, Rex Puyuma, Hopi, Nelson Danford, Apache. Rex can receive a message in Hopi and you see the dotted line over to another Hopi, Orville Wadsworth. Then he can pass that in English to Nelson Danford who then can relate into Apache to Paul Burdett who is, who is another Apache. I suspect there were other men at the central, uh, at the center here of all these languages that they could relate to, but it's a radio, a multilingual radio net using pairs of code talkers of different languages. Uh, this is just a quick list of groups from World War II. Again, some of the numbers, what type of code talking, there are several uh, type one groups, but most are uh, type two groups in World War II. And then there are units over here, different and everywhere from the Aleutians uh, down into Guadalcanal, down into New Guinea, uh, Europe, North Africa, et cetera. Uh, what are the advantages of Native American code talking overall? And this kind of applies for both world wars. Speed, obviously. Most of the messages could be done in a couple minutes or so. Uh, written back out in English, handed off and implemented. By coding with machine, like the machine, the Marines cycle, um, shackle cipher, uh, sometimes took an hour and a half, all the way up to three or four, depending on the length of the messages. So this would be as quick as I talking to you on the phone, you turning around, translating it back into another language and handing it off. Security. None of the codes were ever uh, broken or anything of that nature. Um, 
no indication any compromise whatsoever. The Japanese did know that Navajo was being used against them, and they actually captured a fluent Navajo that was at Bataan before it fell. He was a fluent speaker. However, he, he did not even know the code talkers had formed. They formed after he was captured. And so he, they made him listen to the language. He could not break it. He could understand bits and pieces, but he could not break the code because he was not trained as a code talker. Uh, the Navajo code was formally classified until 1968. And the, again, there's no indication, another popular belief, no indication that the other tribes were ordered to keep uh, code program secret. Uh, Pawnees, Comanches told me specifically they were never given any kind of orders like that. It was common sense not to talk about it during the war, but afterwards there was no stipulations. And again, we found lots and lots of press, uh, newspaper articles indicating that probably most groups had no provisions whatsoever once the war ended. A um, couple individuals I knew, both are, are gone now, but uh, I was fortunate to work with uh, code talkers from a, a handful, maybe five or six different tribes, uh, some of the later ones, and record as much firsthand testimony uh, to supplement other data. Um, there's been a lot of forms of recognition on a tribal level, on a state level, also on a national level. And so we're going to briefly see a few of these to wind up our uh, program today. Um, the Navajo, of course, were huge with over 400 members. So they formed, uh, when their code was declassified, they formed the Navajo Code Talker Association, uh, have a very uh, impressive monument at Window Rock, Arizona. And of course, have done a lot of civic, really good civic work with military groups, public schools, things of that nature, and uh, very generous with their, their time and efforts over the decades. Um, these are some examples of tribal recognition. The Choctaw had a medal produced for their own code talkers. Um, the Hopis uh, installed a plaque in their tribal uh, headquarters with eight gentlemen that were in the Army, two that were in the Army Air Corps. The Comanches have a similar statue like the Navajos, but very unique, their own, down at Lawton, Oklahoma. And then the Choctaws, this is their Choctaw Code Talker Memorial at Tushkahoma. Um, Oklahoma, state of Oklahoma, the country of France came together and honored the Choctaw and Comanche in 1989. And this was an important event because it kind of kickstarted a lot of the other groups to start seeking recognition for their Code Talkers. Uh, in 2001, the Navajo were awarded uh, congressional gold and silver medals for their code talkers, and very deservedly so. Um, this also was another big uh, step that spurred other tribes to say, what about, what about us? And also many of us were in World War I or we were formed before the Navajos. And so it started a grassroots movement and intertribal movement all across the country that is where kind of I got involved in all this. Uh, the movie Wind Talkers came out in 2002, which raised public awareness. Um, the gist of the movie, though, is about 180 degrees compromised. Uh, the guards for Navajo code talkers were only put in after numerous Navajos were mistaken for being Japanese based on their looks and their, and their uh, foreign language. And uh, it was not as the movie presents at all and everything, but still raised a great deal of, uh, of national awareness. There has been a lot of pop culture um, with the Code Talkers, different things from Pendleton Blankets to G.I. Joe dolls to American currency, so more in the public era. Um, I originally did the Comanche Code Talker book in 2002, and I'm still just recently finished a World War I volume and hope to finish a World War II volume um, in a few years to come. In 2004, after my first book, I got a call from Senator Tom Daschle's office, was invited to testify, uh, asked to be kind of like the academic uh, spokesman. Um, so on, on all Native American code talking groups. And so this kick started with the Choctaws, the Comanches and several other tribes involved. We submitted all our information, our testimony. Um, it led to uh, legislation getting started and eventually in four years, the other tribes got the equivalent award of what the Navajo had received. And so the Code Talker Recognition Act of 2008 uh, gave equal recognition. The tribes were invited to uh, participate in helping to design the medals 
And so these are just some examples of the Choctaw, the Muscogee, uh, the Cherokee tribal metals. Uh, they have small replicas on sale uh, from the US Mint. And the metals are very, they're very specific. They have language from many of these nations. They have clan symbols. They have things directly related to the men and the tribe that they are uh, representing. So they're very, very unique. Um, five years later, uh, the gold medal ceremony and silver medal ceremonies for the other code talkers. So 33 groups were recognized this day. And this is at Emancipation Hall at the US Capitol. And then uh, the second one at the uh, NMAI where the silver, silver medal ceremony was held after that. And so each tribe received a gold medal, each family or surviving code talker uh, received a uh, uh, silver one. And these are just some of the uh, delegations, the Choctaw delegation receiving their gold medal. And then this is the one World War II veteran who was physically able to attend the gold medal ceremony. Uh, this was Edmund Harjo, and he has a very unique story about how he became a code talker. Um, and he passed away about four months after this. So we were lucky that he could, uh, he could join us that day. Um, these are some other individuals from different tribes, some of them related to many of the code talkers, but were instrumental in working together over the years. We've done a lot of things that are veteran related, uh, native veteran uh, related projects. Uh, I have a short bibliography here for those of you that are interested later, if you're interested in more research or some of the statistics and facts on code talkers. And with that, I will simply say there is more research still to be done and I'm still working on, on uh, other projects with it. Uh, thank you so much for participating today and joining in and I will be happy to take all the uh, Q&A that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill, for that wonderful presentation. I know we, I learned a lot and I know our audience did as well. Um, we have a lot of questions, and so okay. we'll try to get to as many as we can in the time okay. we have. Um, I think I, I'm going to start with a few questions that, um, that were repeated so that several people are interested in first. Um, first, uh, can you talk a little bit about Canadian First Nations code talkers, what, uh, what, whether you know much about them and what, yeah. what do we know? There is, uh, yeah, I, I do not have in this presentation. There are a number of Cree that were used, and um, uh, and there is a there is a small uh, about a fourteen minute uh, documentary that is on YouTube. If you put in Canadian Cree code talkers, you can find it. And uh, yes, there is a small group there. The last individual in that group, and his name was uh, Tompkins. Uh, he was interviewed a couple times before he passed, so we do have some specifics about it. Uh, I do. I have a small amount of material on there, not as much as I would like to have. But yes, there there are groups there. Um, now he he references that he was. There were many natives that were being tested the day that he was called in to be tested for this in England, and they were using them mostly uh, for Army Air Corps bombing missions uh, to run communications across the channel so that those would not be intercepted and, and picked up on. He mentions that there were multiple groups, but he only knew, I think there was a group of six of them, if I remember right. There are likely other groups of six or small numbers. We just don't have all that material yet. Thank you. Excellent. Um, can we go back to boarding schools? Mm -hmm. uh, were they uh, targeted by the military for recruitment? Was the was the was it compulsory for students to enlist? Was it voluntary? Uh, how in your research, what did you find was that? And a sort of secondary question um, that came up was uh, that how did people hold on to the languages even though they went through the boarding school experience? Um, on average, were they learning it when they back, got back home? How did that happen? So first, okay. recruitment. Uh, yeah, there there are there are clear uh, indications because these had big big clusters of of 17, 18 year old men that were right there already together and everything. Um, several of the boarding schools had they were military style, so these students already were accustomed to wearing a military style uniform, making their bunks, marching to classes. Uh, some of them even had close order drill and things. Um, some of them also had like the equivalent of what we would call ROTC units, 
So there was kind of a cadet cadet component in some of them too, which would kind of uh, Tom Holm used the expression, it, it preconditioned you really to really transition into military uh, service with a lot less culture shock or transition shock, you know, to it. Um, there is the, there is the um, Indian scout syndrome idea uh, that was, uh, that was present there. And it, there's still a certain amount of it alive today and, and through all the wars um, that there is this biological innate natural martial ability in native Americans uh, to serve and perform military type tasks and everything. And depending on who you talk to, some people will embrace that and others will say, I grew up in the city and I can't do any of those things. So it's another one of those things that it might apply to some people, but clearly it's a stereotype, you know, but that was setting up uh, the expectation of this. Now, as far as I know, uh, it was voluntary enlistment. Now, when the draft came up later, yes, there were Native Americans drafted, but a lot of the gentlemen that I know, you know, studied in World War One and World War Two, a lot of them went, uh, a lot of them joined before the draft started. They went in voluntarily and everything. And um, there's a story about the um, Bochito Academy where the entire baseball team of uh, Choctaws went to the superintendent and requested when the recruiter come that we want to all go. And he gave them his blessing and permission and the whole baseball team enlisted that day. And so later they went to individual stations, of course, but, uh, but a lot of voluntary. Now, regarding the language, again, there's, there's no one answer that fits every scenario. Um, I interviewed personally people, say, born in the 1890s, late 1890s that went through the boarding schools. Some of them uh, were severely punished for speaking the language and everything. Some of them told me, they said, it really depended on the school you're at and the individual superintendent. Some superintendents were by the book 24 seven and others said, as long as you do your work, if you're on the playground, I don't care. And, and many of them said by the, uh, the World War II group, by the 20s and 30s, it was really loosening up a lot more. There were, uh, like at Riverside Indian School in, in Anadarko, Oklahoma, they were having dances and native cultural practices. And there was a lot more, uh, if you want to say, restoration of those kind of things. But particularly the earlier group, yeah, some of them had it very rough. The older, the pattern I found is the older you entered the boarding school, the more likely you're able to hold on to that language. If you went as a very, very young child, a lot of times you left monolingual. If you went in at 10 or 12 sometimes, uh, you already knew the language. It was so solid in you that you could, you could maintain it when you got out. And then, of course, a lot of students told me, um, well, they were old, older elders when I interviewed them, but they said, you know, every time we were out on the playground, we'd post a a, a watchman or something and they'd whistle if a teacher came so when they whistled we just went back into English and it made them happy and then we'd go back into Comanche and so you know kids are going to be kids and and they're going to find a way to use their language and hang on to it you know thank you and, and also the yeah. if if your if your school was closer to your home community you had more and more frequent interaction with your family on, on holidays and breaks and sometimes even close to the community. If you went to one of those out of state boarding schools, you were much more isolated away from your language group. So that would have been a factor as well. Wonderful, thank you. Um, several questions from people about whether the Germans ever attempted to break the language code and, if, and is there any evidence that they saw the newspaper article since it was in the press and what the German or enemy response was to that? Yeah, um, let, me, let me say World War I first. There are a couple of German officers uh, captured, pretty high ranking in the Meuse-Argonne campaign. And um, the dialogue, it's so interesting. They were so polite and the American officers were so, the officers were real polite to one another, but they were asking, you know, can I ask a question? And he said, those languages you're using, we've never heard those in the world. And we know most of the world's languages, what were they? And all they would ever say, they said, we just smiled and said, well, that was American, of course. And of course they're not gonna tell them. But uh, I don't think they had, in World War I, they didn't have time to break these. They, they were, there, there just was not the time to actually break these. In World War II, there are stories about German anthropologists coming to the United States in the 30s and trying to study some of the languages. I've never really found, I've found rumors, but I really have never found anything concrete 
uh, to really back that up. Um, now, we do know that there were German anthropologists here in the, in the same way we had anthropologists over there and, and everywhere else. So it's possible, it's quite possible, but I don't know of any cases of them actually um, succeeding or anything. And um, a lot of time, uh, the, first you have to identify what language it is, and then you've got to have a, a base to compare it with, you know. Uh, the other thing with the newspaper articles, I'm sure they must have seen some of those. Uh, undoubtedly, they saw them. But again, whether they had access to those home communities or could, uh, uh, you know, break, break some of those languages, uh, very likely at that time, you know, once the war started. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a lot of questions about from people about speakers of many different tribes. So I wonder if you have a resource, perhaps we can, if we can't put the bibliography slide back up, maybe we can um, share resources after our presentation. Um, but, uh, but how many different tribes did um, participate as, I mean, that we know of as in the code talking? Um. And my, my number is going to be a little higher because I've got three groups that have not been federally recognized yet. And I'm trying to I'm trying to get them the same recognition and I've got very good documentation for them. So there were 33 recognized under the Code Talker Act of 2008. The Navajo make 34. And I know of three others that have not been recognized. So I would say 37 that are known at this time. Now, in some cases, that's as small as two individuals. And then in some cases, it's as large as 420 with the Navajo. So, you know, uh, most groups, a couple groups were 17, but most groups are, they're very small pockets of people. So they're, you know, they're 10 or under. And can you clarify, uh, when you talked about class, uh, co talking being classified or not, can you clarify, there's a couple questions about the Navajo program. Was it the code that was classified for the Navajo? Because they did have some sort of classification what yes. aspect were they not able to talk about? It's, uh, and, and I think I, I've addressed that in a, in a manuscript I've got at, at press right now. Um, the best I can tell, yes, the code was classified. Uh, they were, we have dozens and dozens of testimony. They were told not to talk about it when they entered. They were told not to reveal it in any way when they were discharged. However, um, there's one Navajo code talker in 1944 that came home and gave a very detailed report to a New Mexico newspaper. And I've got a copy of that, you know. Um, we have leaks. Um, I found somewhere between um, 1942 and 1968 in the neighborhood of 45 published sources identifying the Navajo code talkers. I think my, my best guess, my hunch at this time is that the code was classified. However, the Marines published three articles by their own journalists in 1945, right at the end of the war. So I think by that time, uh, they were pretty well, the war's ending, we don't have to secure this. Now, the actual code book with the code terms, that was kept under wraps into the 68. And so I think what happened was uh, the, code, the code terms itself and the book and the papers were still under lock and key. Talking about it at that time was no longer uh, classified. And I think at that point, there's no way they can find all these men who have went home, looked them up. They're not going to engage in that, you know, uh, because I just found too many, too many people in the military and other, uh, you know, high ranking things that freely talked about it after the war including the Marine, the Marine Corps' own magazine. So I, I think it's the code materials that was classified. Um, and speaking about after the war, was co-talking considered uh, for any uh, conflict beyond World War II? Or did it, what, why did it stop? Good, excellent question. Um, there are some rumors that it was used in Korea and even Vietnam. Um, several of the Navajo code talkers went right back into uh, Korea. Some of the Comanche code talkers, at least two of them, went right back into Korea. None of them were used for any kind of code whatsoever. There was no effort to pull them together to use them, etc. Now, there was a, um, a type of communications device called an ASAM-7 that came out in 1950. And what this did was it, it, it took us light years from 1945 to 50 we can encrypt messages that are much harder to break or get into. And so literally it superseded 
what the speed of these voice languages give us. And so the computer basically began to take off in, uh, but it's called the, the model was called the ASAM seven and everything. And as, as much as I hate to say it, but it, it, it made it passe, you know, it was cutting, cutting edge for its time and everything. But once we got that computer things now, this is not to say that um, I know I've interviewed Vietnam commanders that they said, I'll put a couple of Spanish speaking guys on there just to give them something else, you know, sometimes. And, and, uh, but it wasn't in code necessarily, you know, but I do not know of any, um, of any actual, um, you know, documentation that it was ever used um, in Korea or Vietnam. So, so because of the uh, influence of computers, the native languages and the code talking program probably wouldn't then have influenced cryptography later cryptography um well or maybe yeah i mean maybe i think it's definitely because at, at, at fort meade at the cryptological museum uh it does have a very important like chapter in history now in cryptography as a stage of it and everything but i do not know that it uh i do not know that it necessarily uh influenced it you i think you would have to look into the nature of how codes are being formed, is there any similarity there? And that question I can't answer and everything. I think we have time for one more question. I, I wish we could talk for another hour because there are such good questions coming in and, and, and yeah. I'm sorry that we won't be able to get to all of them. But um, there was actually a question I had um, that I think might be a good way to end on a positive note is, do you have any stories about the, the gentleman that you interviewed, um, it, it, that any personal stories, any humorous stories of what they in, encountered in the field or stories about how they met ha in happenstance? Um, yeah, one of the happenstance, um, <clears throat> Edmund Harjo was walking through an apple orchard about three days after D-Day, so June, June of 45, he heard an individual singing in Muskogee in his language. And he was not just singing a song, he was singing a morning song. So, so he lost somebody. Well, he made a beeline for that, that voice and found this other guy and they started talking in Muskogee. And a uh, officer came by and, you know, what are you guys you know, doing? And we're just visiting, I just met him, you know, he's from my tribe, et cetera. He took down their names and, and um, unit designation said, I may be in touch and they thought, you know, what for were, were nobodies, they're private and a corporal, you know. Well, about three days later, he gets a slip and, you know, you're no longer with this unit, report to this and such and such. He goes over there and they said, go wait in that tent there. He opens the tent, there's the other guy sitting there. They pulled him. They become a radio team the rest of the war. Uh, there's another case in, in Alaska uh, that involved the troops in Alaska uh, before they got there. Um, an individual officer had a had a native uh, guy who again was Muskogee in his uh, entourage. And he, he called, you know, invariably they called everybody chief at the time. But um, he said, chief, we, I found out we got another chief in the division. He goes, oh, is that right? He says, yeah. And he said, I want you to do something. So they're at the dinner, they're in the mess hall. And he says, I want you to stand up and as loud as you can in your voice, call out, uh, pick up a piece of bread, stand up and hold it in the air, hold it up. And he's, are you crazy? You know, no, direct order, do it. Okay, so he gets up and he hollers this out and everybody's looking around and this head pops up way over here. And this guy stands up, picks up a piece of bread and holds it up and he answers back, now what do you want me to do with it? And that's how they found out they spoke the same language. Uh, one, of them, one was Seminole, one was Muskogee, but they spoke the same dialect. Now on a funny story, um, the Comanches were with the 4th Infantry Division were stalled out on the Siegfried line. So this would have been about September of 44, uh, I believe. And um, one of them, Charles Chibitty, was up near the front line. His brother got a pass. His brother was in a totally different uh, unit division, got a pass to come visit him. So he's up there visiting him near the line. And he said, hey, our, our first cousin is on the radio at headquarters. I just talked to him. You want to talk to him? Sure. So he hands him the mic and uh, then he takes it back and he says, hey, why don't you pretend to be a German who speaks fluent Comanche and you know the code? He goes, I got it. I got it. So he calls in there and, you know, everything. Yeah. And uh, he's telling him in Comanche, he says, you know, I'm a, I'm a German officer. 
and um, I've, uh, I want you to keep talking that Comanche language. I, I know you, what you're saying. I'm writing every bit of it down. Just keep on going. And he says, um, Awohana, you know, uh, or, or no, he says, Ona, Onahaka, Onahaka, who are you? Who are you? He says, Awohana, I'm your enemy, you know. And they said they could just hear the whole communication station just explode. All these Comanches are excited and, you know, the other ones back there. And uh, he's talking to his own first cousin and he doesn't recognize him. So finally, he said he had to switch into English. And he said, Larry, Larry, it's it's Mead. It's your it's your brother in Comanche. He's not a cousin. He's a brother. It's your brother, Mead. Mead, you know, uh, Mead Chai Bitty and everything. Well, then he began to reply with a lot of expletives, we might say, and really give him what for. And an officer broke in and said, what's going on in this line? And he said, uh, nothing, sir. We're, we're just talking Indian. And he says, that last part definitely was not Indian. And so anyway, they had to get off the, they got kicked off the line and everything. But there were, um, in the midst of all the things that they you know, endured. And there's a lot of, a lot of things we don't have time to cover very traumatic things, but, um, they still found, um, you know, humor and, um, and situations and things like that, which, uh, I'm sure, um, alleviated some, some of the stress, you know, a little bit and everything, but, uh, they had a lot of fond stories that they, that they shared. Thank you so much for sharing some of their stories with us. It really helps to, um, to both humanize their experience and, and bring us, you know, present with them. So, and thank you for sharing all your knowledge with us today. I'm, I'm sorry that that's all the time we have for questions. And thank you so much for everyone who joined us today. Thank you. Thank you.